Alright guys, I want to cover some wrestling. I want to talk about AEW Double or Nothing, All Elite Wrestling, this new wrestling promotion that's going to be on TNT later on this year, and very exciting time for wrestling fans because finally the World Wrestling Entertainment is going to have some competition again in some sense. And uh, so Cody Rhodes, the son of the legendary Dusty Rhodes, uh, him and his tag team, the Young Bucks, have pretty much came up with this company. Uh, they got together and they wanted to sell out an arena um, with all these indie stars and uh, they created a lot of buzz online. They came up with this show, they called it All In, and uh, I never did watch that all the way through, but it was pretty exciting and uh, it caught a lot of interest. It was a really good show. And so it was just a collaboration of these guys getting together to want to do this. And um, then I guess this million or this billionaire, uh, I don't know what his name is, Khan, Tony Khan or something, uh, the son of this and this Khan family. Anyways, he's a billionaire. He, he was interested, and he's kind of backing them now. And they've created this company, All Elite Wrestling. And so they've had their first pay per view. And so uh, they had the all-in show, but that wasn't under the AEW banner. But then this uh, Double or Nothing show was under their, the first show under the banner. And their second show, All Out, will be coming up um, in August in uh, Chicago. I'm tempted to go to that because tickets go on sale in a couple of weeks. and It'll be interesting because that's when they're going to crown their first champion. But I don't know all the details about everything, and I just want to give my opinions on the matches and uh, what I thought of the show overall. And I um, watched it with my mom a few days ago, so I'm, everything's not fresh in my mind about all the moves and all the particular spots and everything, but whatever I can remember, I'm just going to go over the card. They had like an hour pre-show before the actual pay-per-view. I don't really exactly know how long the pay-per-view was. It seemed kind of long. I don't know if it was a few hours or what. But um, they had the hour pre-show. And I don't know when that started with wrestling. You know, WWE's been doing that for a while. I don't know if they kind of copied that off of the UFC or off of sports. But I remember it used to not, they used to not have the pre-show. I mean, WWE did used to have the show Sunday Night Heat before they would go on the pay-per-view. But basically, the pre the pre show was free for anybody to view on YouTube or, or other platforms, and it's to get people to buy. And they actually called the pre show the buy in. So AEW they've been using these gambling terms, and this uh, double or nothing was in Las Vegas, so it suited that. Um, you know, so first of all, their first show, you know, before becoming a company, was all in. You know, like you're going all in with your poker chips or whatever. And then Double or Nothing is the, the, the second, but the really first pay-per-view under the banner. Right now they don't have a weekly TV show, but they're going to have one on TNT in the future. I don't know if it's going to be like in the fall or something like that. So we got a little while for that. They're not doing a, a, a show, you know, like a pay-per-view every month. They do have this Fighter Fest show coming up. I'm not sure if that, that's really a pay-per-view or, or how that is, but the next big show is all out. That's when they're going to crown their champion. They had a couple of qualifying matches for d Double or Nothing to see who would be in the, uh, you know, the cha in match for the championship. But first of all, I'm going to talk about the pre-show. I was just going to skip it, but I watched it with my mom. I figured I might as well watch it from beginning to end. And uh, they, they started off with a, what was it, a, let me see, I'm going to go off of Wikipedia and see some of the stuff. It was a 21-man casino battle royal. And I don't know exactly what the rules for this were, but basically there were 21 men. It started off with a handful of them in the ring, and then later on another handful came in, later on another handful came in. And battle royals are always fun. It was an over-the-top battle royal. Uh, to eliminate someone, they have to be thrown over the top rope, and both feet have to touch the floor outside. Which is interesting to note that at the beginning of this match, there was like an amputee in the match in the corner. I don't know his name or anything. I don't know a lot of these stars' names, but... Uh, so this guy had no legs, but he had arms, and uh, he was in the match, which was interesting. Um, I don't remember all who was in it. I know that Glacier, an old WCW wrestler, was in it, so that was cool. Tommy Dreamer, an old ECW hardcore wrestler, was in there. Uh, so they had some legends. They had some indie people. And, uh, you know, a lot of them I didn't really know. 
but uh, it was exciting and I enjoyed it. Um, there's the bad boy Joey Joey Janela, and uh, there is a uh, this hardcore deathmatch fighter named uh, Jimmy Havoc, and they had some hardcore action in this match. Uh, Jimmy Havoc or Joey Janela at one time he took out a cigarette and started smoking it in the ring, and then uh, Jimmy Havoc took the cigarette. And next thing you know, he stapled it to Joey's forehead. So uh, Jimmy Havoc's one of those nasty deathcore wrestlers you know, or deathmatch wrestlers who uses you know barbed wire and thumbtacks and staplers and light tubes and all the really sharp, dangerous stuff. But uh, he had, he brought a stapler in with him and he was stapling people. He stapled. The cigarettes of Joey Janela's forehead, that was funny. And uh, they kind of cut away from it because there was like other action going on and then, you know, we saw Joey Janela light up the cigarette and the next thing you know it's like stuck to his forehead he's like, oh. And uh, I remember Jimmy Havoc stapled Tommy Dreamer in the crotch. Tommy Dreamer is the hardcore legend. He came in with a trash can and a trash can lid and just started whacking everybody in the head with the trash can lid. And uh, so there was a lot of mayhem, a lot of good moves. Billy Gunn was also in the match. Um, you know, one half of the New Age Outlaws in the WWE, part of the X, the Generation X. And uh, there was this guy, MJF, that everybody really liked. I don't remember what his name stands for. Michael something Feldman or something like that. Some extravagant name. He's a heel, he's a bad guy. And just thinks that he's one of the best. He was one who was uh, kicking, he was kicking that uh, guy uh, with no legs and stuff, so he was getting the heel heat. And uh, the guy with no legs uh, didn't really do a lot until a certain point. And then Sean Spears came in, and Sean Spears is the perfect 10 of the WWE. He just recently left WWE to be able to come here. They dropped the ball on him, and uh, don't know if he's actually signed with AEW. I don't know how many of these people in this battle royal are actually part of the company or if they're just there for like a handshake deal. But anyway, Sean Spears came in there and he was over as a face, you know, a good guy, and he was fighting that MJF guy. And uh, he had MJF like hanging on the ropes, and then uh, the amputee guy came and did like the 619 that Rey Mysterio does, where uh, the MJF guy was hanging to where he was facing. He was hanging like in the middle rope or the bottom one and uh, looking outwards towards the audience and then the uh, amputee guy came and grabbed the ropes and swung around and kind of like kicked him in the face. And then he did, and then he jumped off the ropes and did like a like a 450 or a flip or something. So he was pretty acrobatic, uh, pretty good. Um, and there's going to be spoilers in this review and you know what it came down to was Hangman Adam Page just kind of uh, kind of country boy kind of gimmick guy came out and uh, he's one of their top guys. He was supposed to have a match with another guy on, on the card named Neville and uh, that didn't come through and uh, so they threw him in the battle royal. Now whoever was to win this battle royal was to be one of the contenders for the uh, world title at the next show and then whoever won the main event was going to be the other one. So Hangman Adam Page came in and he won the match. Uh, there were some big guys in the match. There was also a guy named Luchasaurus, who was really tall. He didn't seem like really beefy, but he was tall. And uh, they had a bigger guy who seemed kind of like an overweight guy, but he was one of the monsters. Not a really, not a lot of really big hosses, you know, muscular. That's something that AEW is kind of missing. Uh, you know, usually the WWE gets criticized for overdoing it with all the big muscle meathead guys, but. Uh, AEW could use some, but there was a lot of chaos in that match, a lot of good stuff, and it was fun. You know, I enjoyed it, and uh, I don't know what else to say about it. I'm sure there's a lot more, um, but I'll skip to the next match on the pre-show, on the buy-in. It was Kip Sabian and Sammy, Sammy Guevara. I liked both of these guys a lot. Sammy Guevara has this whole panda bear gimmick thing. He's a bad guy. He's all cocky. He comes out with this big panda bear head thing on top of him. And I thought this was like a really good like 205 Live like cruiserweight uh, match. Like 205 Live is the WWE's cruiserweight show where the guys who are under 205 pounds wrestle, and they they're known for doing the flips and all the acrobats and all that. 
I felt like this was one of the matches that could have been in like the, the in the Cruiserweight Classic, like the the championships. And you know, I read some people say that it wasn't so exciting, but I really dug it. I'm looking forward to more from Kip Sabian and Sammy Guevara. Kip Sabian won that one. And then, uh, so we go to the show, the first match. And one thing that's awesome about AEW is uh, they have Pyro, which the WWE's been missing. I guess Vince McMahon just thinks it's a waste of money to have Pyro, you know, explosions on the stage and stuff. But wrestling's always been about the pop and circumstance and, uh, you know, the larger than life characters. And Pyro's one of the things I've always missed. And um, another thing that was showcased at AEW tonight. Uh, was blood, or I mean, on that night, not tonight, but they had a lot of blood, especially in one match, and uh, the WWE doesn't do that. The WWE is rated PG. They do have blood every now and then, you know, accidents happen, and as soon as it does, the referee gets on gloves, and sometimes if it's too bad, they gotta cancel the match. But back in the day, you know, wrestlers bled a lot, and sometimes it, it, makes, the, it makes the match more exciting. And uh, usually, you know, the wrestlers do it in a safe way to where it seems like they bleed a lot, but they know what they're doing. And, and medical, you know, there's uh, people nearby to jump on the situation if it's too bad. But uh, So, AEW is supposed to be catered more to the adult fans. AEW is supposed to be catering to just a wider audience in general. You know, it, it, like I said, it had the hardcore wrestling, it has, you know, the cruiserweights, it has... The entertainment aspect it has you know it has women wrestlers and, and all kinds of stuff so uh, but we opened the show and then they did some funny stuff Cody Rhodes and the Young Bucks came out and you know they were, they said they were happy about the show starting and everything and Kenny Omega came out with them Kenny Omega is one of their main stars and he's in the main event with Chris Jericho Chris Jericho is one of the most popular names in the company uh, obviously he's been a wrestler for like what 30 years or something and then he started his own band in Fozzie and he's successful at that. He's done just about everything and he's wrestled in Japan, he's wrestled for WCW, ECW, WWE. He beat The Rock and Stone Cold in one night and, and won the you know Unified Undisputed Championship. Um, so anyway they came out with Kenny Omega he, he was facing Chris Jericho later later that night and they were having some fun. These guys are goofballs and uh, they were taking shots at WWE. They were saying how they sold out uh, like 20,000 seats in the arena and then one of them's like, hold on, this arena only holds like 12 or 13,000. <laughs> and they're like, well, in wrestling we always round up because the WWE always exaggerates how many, you know, people were out there show. They count like the popcorn salesmen and everything. They, they, they just over exaggerate and they always say they're setting new records and everything. So they took some shots at the WWE that night. But um, they started the show with SoCal Uncensored and uh, the Strong Hearts. SoCal Uncensored, Christopher Daniels, Frankie Kazarian, and Scorpio Sky are pretty well known from fans of ROH and Impact Wrestling. Christopher Daniels is one of the great wrestlers that never really had a good run in WWE. I don't know if he had a run at all, but I know Kazarian was there for a short while. Christopher Daniels was, you know, had some great matches with AJ Styles and Samoa Joe, and he's pretty much up there with their lead. And uh, he's a little older now, but uh, all three of those guys, SoCal and Censored, are awesome. They came out and cut a promo, got everybody really hyped. Uh, before they started the match, and uh, they're 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 supposed to be like the bad guys, but everybody loves them anyway. And uh, the Strong Hearts, Seema, T Hawk, and L Lindemann. I didn't know these guys. They were uh, Asian. I don't know if they're Chinese or what, but they were great. And I love this match. And it was a hell of a way to kick off the show. It was one of the best matches of the night. And uh, just the moves they did in there, and the kickouts. And I never really knew who was going to win for sure. And uh, I was really impressed, and I'd love to see more from all of those guys. I really do. I love Christopher Daniels, and uh, just a great, great way to, to kick off the match show. And uh, SoCal Uncensored won. Uh, they they beat the uh, Strong Hearts. Now the next, there were some skits in here. I don't remember really where they were placed, but maybe I can talk about those. I don't know, but. 
The next one, basically, we had the women's match, one of the women's matches. It was supposed to be a triple threat between Nyla Rose, Kylie Ray, and, uh, let's see, I don't remember the other girl's name, and I can't really get a good look here on Wikipedia. i got to move this around. Okay. Uh, Nyla Rose. Oh, okay, Dr. Britt Baker. So there's this woman who's a dentist, Dr. Britt Baker. Britt Baker and Kylie Ray were kind of uh, thinner girls. Kylie Ray was supposed to be really lovable and you know, always smiling, and um, that was kind of her character. She was an over-the-top face, good guy, you know. I don't know whether Britt Baker was a face or a heel, but uh, Nyla Rose was a bigger woman. She was like the muscle in this match. She, they called her uh, something beast, something I don't know. The natural beast or something. She came out with like a face mask on. She looked kind of intimidating, kind of interesting. Um, but then there was a surprise. Brandy Rhodes, Cody Rhodes' wife came out. She's like the commissioner or something like that. And uh, she said that she wanted to make this match awesome. And uh, Awesome Kong came out. And Awesome Kong is really awesome. Uh, she's this big black woman. And uh, she was in the WWE and TNA. And she was one of the leaders of you know, women's wrestling really taking off because she was just brutal. She, she would just take the other women and power bomb them and she does the spinning back fist and uh, and so uh, she had a really crappy run in WWE and I don't remember what happened she had a miscarriage or something and and she left but now she's back and uh, so that was awesome to see her that was one of the surprises a lot of us were looking forward to surprises to see who was going to show up in this company and uh, that was one that I never heard of anybody really expecting this match was okay. I think it was a step down from the uh, the first match. I think the women uh, need to develop more. They had uh, Ali on commentary. Another thing was they had three commentators throughout this pay-per-view, and one of them was Jim Ross. And Jim Ross is the legendary uh, WWE announcer. He's one of the he's the greatest announcer uh, commentator probably of all time, really. And they have him, which is phenomenal for them. They also have Justin Roberts as the uh, ring announcer, who is also used to work in the WWE, and uh, he does a great job. But they had Allie on commentary, she didn't really say a whole lot, but uh, she was probably just taking it all in. They have other women who are there that, that weren't in this match. So they do have a, you know, they got a handful of female talents. I think that the women's division is going to need some more development since probably a lot of these people aren't known, except for Awesome Kong, and she's probably still not as known, you know, as, you know, I don't know if they don't really have any women that are like really, really well known, I think, to the public, you know, the general mainstream audience, but it was a good match. I mean, uh, basically Awesome Kong pretty much got taken out of the match. We didn't see a lot from Awesome Kong here. She's been out of wrestling for a good while, so it makes me wonder, you know, if she's still going to be able to go, if she's still going to be able to put on those classics like she used to. Uh, but I think, you know, they kind of held back on purpose, so, you know, we didn't get to see everything from her in this match. But hopefully, you know, in the next matches she'll be more impressive. But she didn't really do a whole lot. The other girls were impressive. Um, but uh, Britt Baker is the one who won, the one who's the dentist. It was a pretty good match. Best friends Chuck Taylor, Trent Beretta, uh, wrestled Angelico and Jack Evans. It was a tag team match. This match was phenomenal. I think it picked it back up again. This was one of my favorite matches too. Um, and I've been able to see the best friends in person right in front of me in AAW in Chicago. Chuck Taylor and Trent Beretta, they're funny. Good wrestlers. Chuck Taylor was in the WWE before they wrestled in Japan. Angelico and Jack Evans, you know, They've been popular on Lucha Underground, and uh, they're really good at just all the flips and the tag team moves. And there was some comedy in this match with the best friends. You know, there was a, a spot where they tried to hug each other. They, they're in opposite corners, and they hit their opponents into the opposite corners, and then they kind of turned around, looked at each other, and they were going to go for an embrace, and then the opponents came up behind them and attacked both of them. And then later on, they, we finally got to see them hug it out. And... Um, I remember the part where Chuck Taylor like knocked, he was like cleaning house and he knocked down 
Evans and Angelico and they started barking like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it was hilarious. I love that. It made me crack up. But uh, the best friends won, and then there was some team, uh, the Super Smash Bros, that came in and beat both of them. Like the lights went out for a while, and a bunch of a bunch of men in, in black and masks surround the ring, and then these other two guys came in and they all beat them up. And uh, all the guys in the black with the masks on, like formed like a human throne for for one of the Super Smash Bros. guys. He was like a a bigger guy. There was a bigger one, a little one. I thought that was kind of stupid. I didn't really like that ending. Um, and before they all got attacked, uh, the two tag teams like shook they, they, they shook hands or they hugged it out, whatever. Uh, so they showed their respect for each other, then the lights went out, and then they got blasted. And I know stuff like this is supposed to build suspense for what's in the future to see these guys or whatever, but the other tag team didn't look cool to me. I don't know. Um, I'll have to see more of them, but... I thought that was kind of stupid. I could have done without that. And then we got the six-woman tag match, which had uh, the Joshi wrestlers, the the Asian women, um, Hikaru Shida, Riho, Ryo, <laughs> Mizuzami, I don't know, Aji Kong, Yuka Sakazaki, Emi Sakura. I don't know any of these women, but. They were really good. This was a really good match. It was hard hitting. I mean, I like this better than the, the triple threat match, which was actually a fatal four way because they had an awesome call. I will say this was the better women's match. Uh, a lot going on here. Just a lot of different styles from these women. And uh, just some hard hitting stuff. I don't remember a lot of details. But uh, basically, one of the rest, one of the women was a mentor to a woman who was on the other team. And uh, she ended up beating her mentor, basically. And, like, she was the one who won the match. She pinned her mentor. So there was some story there. But since I don't really know any of these women, I haven't really seen them before. But, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing them again. And I hope that some of those are a part of AEW. And uh, I've heard that all of them are, except for one or something. But I don't know. Anyway, let's move on to probably the match of the night, which was Cody versus Dustin Rhodes. This was a battle of the two brothers. They're t the two sons of the legendary Dusty Rhodes. Cody's the one that's pretty much uh, behind this company, and he's the younger one. And Dustin's the older one. He's been in wrestling for quite a while. He was in WCW and, and uh, WWE as Gold Dust, and he left WWE not too long ago. They let him come here and. Uh, work with his brother and uh, he's been great as gold dust uh, but he's a good wrestler he's always been good and this match kind of made me think of WCW because the first time you know there's a, a major wrestling company that's not WWE that's on pay-per-view and Dustin Rhodes was in WCW before this match had the loudest pop of the night as far as I'm concerned um, I don't remember exactly what happened but there was a part where Cody Rhodes uh, this, he took off one of the turnbuckles in the corner, one of the turnbuckle pads, so the steel was exposed. And Dustin Rhodes' head ended up going into it, and uh, he ended up bleeding horrible for the rest of the match. He was just, his face was just covered in blood. He was just dripping, pouring blood out of it like a faucet. Blood was all over his brother. It was all over the mat. This match was a bloody mess, and I watched it with my mom, and she was getting disturbed by it. And even I was at a certain point. I mean... But it, the wrestling was awesome, the story they told about, you know, the two brothers, one was an older generation, one's the younger generation, Cody's trying to prove himself, and um, Cody's kind of the heel, kind of the bad guy, Dustin was, you know, the kind of the good guy. Uh, Brandy Rhodes came out with Cody, and I forgot to mention at the beginning of the match, which is a pretty big detail of the night, is that Cody came out with this entrance, and uh, he had like a throne that represented Triple H's throne from WWE on the stage. And then uh, he took out a sledgehammer, which Triple H uses, and then he walked up and he smashed the throne. So it was pretty symbolic that it was like a shot at the WWE. It was like a shot at Triple H that so he was shattering his throne. Um, so some people really liked that, some people didn't like that, but I did I did enjoy it. I want to see more stuff like that. Other people don't want to see stuff like that, but you know, I don't think it hurts every now and then. It's fun. Wrestling's supposed to be fun. You know, let's bring it back to where, you know. But anyways, anyway, the wrestling was, was great. A lot of near falls and 
figured Cody would win, but wasn't really sure. Uh, Cody did win in the end. And afterwards, Cody uh, he was leaving and he came back in the ring and he said, uh, at the Fighter Fest, he's going to face the, the best tag team in the world, the Young Bucks. And he said uh, he knows who he wants for his partner. He said he doesn't want a friend. Uh, you know, he doesn't want a uh, just a wrestler or whatever. He, you know, he needs a. Uh, he doesn't want a partner. He doesn't want a friend. He said he needs his older brother. And he kind of cracked up a little bit, kind of tearing up. And then uh, I think that him and his brother hugged it out or something. I don't know. And that was it. So a little bit of an emotional moment, which was kind of a turn of events because he's like this vicious bad guy wrestling his brother kind of. And, uh, but Cody Rhodes speared Dustin Rhodes at one part of the match, and then the referee tossed her out. The referee for this match was Earl Hebner, which was another thing that he was a major WWF wrestler referee for a long time. And uh, so, you know, they had Earl Hebner there, they had Jim Ross there, they had Justin Roberts calling the matches. They had some legends there because um, Bret Hart came out and he showed off their title, and their title was amazing. Looks great, and uh, DDP was there, so they're really pulling out you know, all the stops. That was one of the matches of the night. Like I said, I, I think it had the biggest pop of the night. I don't remember what happened, but I remember sometime after Dustin Rose was already busted open and he stood up, and the audience was on their feet like electric, and I was getting goosebumps. Like to me, it was like comparable of like The Rock versus Hogan. I mean, obviously not on that scale. But, you know, that arena for how big it was, you know, they exploded and I was like, man, I want to see more stuff like this. Throughout the whole pay-per-view, the audience was very into it, chanting and cheering. And, you know, sometimes in WWE and in other wrestling promotions and stuff, you get matches where the audience is almost silent because, you know, they're bored out of their mind. We've seen it a million times or whatever. You know, or they just start chanting whatever they feel like because they're not even into the match. You know, they'll, they'll start chanting stuff that has nothing to do with the match. Uh, but, you know, when the audience is really into it and the commentary is really, uh, really good about going over the match, then it puts over, you know, the show a lot more. And they were hitting on all points with that. Then we had the tag team match with the Young Bucks and the Lucha Brothers, Pentagon Jr. and Ray Phoenix, who I've also had the privilege of seeing before. Up close, got to shake hands with both of them. I got a shirt from Ray Phoenix. Um, actually, I don't know if I could get it, but I should have had that. But <laughs> it's uh, probably watered up in the bottom of the clothes hamper or something, but uh, those guys are amazing. You know, they were on Lucha Underground, and now they're, they're a huge acquisition for AEW. And this was a really good match. Another one where they went back and forth a lot, a lot of super kicks and flips, and the moves they did were incredible. The Young Bucks won, and I don't really know what else I want to say about that match, but it was good. It was good. Then we had Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega for the main event, and the winner of this match was going to go on to face Hangman Page, who won the Casino Battle Royal earlier. And their next show, their next big show in Chicago, All Out, on August 31st. Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega. Now, they wrestled in Japan when Chris Jericho showed up to wrestle in New Japan. It was really shocking. He challenged Kenny Omega. They had a great match. It was like a no DQ match, which doesn't happen in Japan. In Japan all the time. And uh, Chris Jericho went on to have some other great matches. Kenny Omega had like five star matches, six star matches with Okada and New Japan. Uh, they had at least uh, a trilogy of matches, at least three matches. Uh, they might have had more, but they had one that went to a, uh, you know, they ran out of time. They went to a time limit draw, and they're just amazing back and forth. So Kenny Omega is one of the best wrestlers in the world up there. But I still don't think he has that name recognition in America, you know, with the mainstream wrestling fans like Chris Jericho does. But once they get on TNT, he definitely will. You know, people will see him, and he's gonna—he's definitely one of their stars. They're both from Canada, so there's that going on. So this was basically their second match, but this time in America, in Las Vegas, and it was a really good match. 
uh, Chris Jericho had this entrance where he came out and there were, it showed like his previous personas uh, before he actually came out. There was guys like dressed up like he used to be dressed up as. And so it's just kind of showing the history of Jericho. It was a fun match. One of the things I remember was Jericho knocking Kenny Omega over the barricade and then Chris Jericho takes the camera and he's like recording. You know, all of a sudden the camera starts shaking and stuff. It's like, what's going on? And then you see like Jericho had the camera and Kenny Omega like spits water in his face. So it was fun and it was a tough, hard hitting. Kenny Omega got like knocked in the nose, so his nose was all bloody and like around his mouth was bloody for most of the match. Um, ended up going through a table. Um, but in the end, Chris Jericho won. And then uh, after Chris Jericho won, he got on the mic, started ripping on everybody at AEW, saying basically that he was their savior, and we all need to thank him for being there and, and for beating Kenny Omega and everything. You know, he's going to go on to beat Hangman Page. Then the big, 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 big exciting moment of the night came when John Moxley, the former Dean Ambrose from the WWE, part of the Shield, uh, came in from the audience and attacked Jericho and he attacked Kenny Omega. John Moxley, uh, who was Dean Ambrose, was a part of this three-man group in the WWE that was really huge with Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, and uh, he just left there months ago, uh, saying that you know he wasn't happy with the creative direction. They let him go, where usually you know they'll keep wrestlers; they won't let them out of their contracts. But for whatever reason, they let him go. And people, you know, we we kind of figured that he was going to become an AEW. We didn't know when, if it would be that soon or what. They made us wait throughout this entire pay-per-view, and then finally, after you know the final match, after Jericho cuts his promo and you think it's over, John Moxley comes out, attacks them both, hits him with his DDT finisher, his double underhook DDT, the dirty beats, whatever he calls it now. And him and Kenny Omega went back and forth, and they fought into the audience, and uh, they fought up to the stage. And on the stage, they had these giant poker chips because it was like a gambling theme in Las Vegas. And uh, they ended up fighting on top of these pile of poker chips, and uh, Dean Ambrose basically ended up throwing him, throwing him off there, and you know he, he busted through something on the bottom. That's how they ended the match, or ended the pay-per-view with the John Moxley standing, you know, the last man standing on top of the poker chips at the stage. So it was like this wild man came in there and caused wreaked havoc, and you know, that's something that makes you want to tune into the next show, what are they going to do now? He's a megastar, he's, he's one of their biggest you know, name recognition, besides Chris Jericho, you know, but he's current, and uh, very exciting. So... I gotta give this man, this pay-per-view, you know, a thumbs up. It was great. Uh, a lot better than anything the WWE's put out there recently. I'm looking forward to the next show. I might go to it live. But uh, I can't really complain much about this at all. You know, I think maybe the weakest match on the card was maybe that, that Fatal 4-Way with the women. Uh, but the six-man tag with the women was was phenomenal, but even still, I mean, the Fatal 4-Way was good, it was still good, but there, there were a lot of other matches on here that really stuck out. I don't know, my favorites might have been uh, the, the beginning six-man tag match, and then the tag match with the best friends and Angelico and Jack Evans and then the match with Cody Rhodes and Dustin Rhodes. But there are so many that were good, it's hard to even say really. <clears throat> Obviously though, I think a lot of people would agree that probably the match of the night was Cody and Dustin. I mean, it had all the emotion, all the blood, it was just a brutal match. And uh, that really stole the show. The audience was so into it. So looking forward to uh, more from these guys, so let me know what you thought about it, alright? God bless guys, see you later.